Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I did attend uh, PGConf EU in the past, uh, back in uh, Dublin and Vienna, who were, I think, in 2015, 16, sorry, 17. Yeah, so it was really a long time ago. And the truth is that I have not come to Europe uh, for the past five years. Uh, I didn't even come back to France because, as, as it may sound, it's truly, uh, I'm going to spill it, I'm French. Uh, so I, they, I speak with a strong French accent if you want. Uh, if you want, I mean, it's hard to do as well. Uh, and so, uh, as Jimmy has mentioned, I do live in Japan. I, I live in Tokyo. I'm based there for 15 years. And just to give you a short presentation about myself, because I forgot to add a slide about that. Uh, I'm working since last, last year for AWS. Uh, I am involved in PostgreSQL itself for the past uh, 15 years, since 2009. And I've been in the seat of uh, being a PostgreSQL patch author, reviewer. Uh, some of you may have seen my blog, even if I tend to slack on that uh, for the past uh, year or so. Uh, and I also act as a committer of the project, working on middle size, small size things most of the time, doing bug fixes, maintenance, sometimes committing larger features or being even the author of a few uh, larger features like you may have used, um, like uh, one of them was a re-index uh, concurrently where you can just re-index things on the fly while authorizing reads, writes uh, while doing that. Um, so th I've been doing quite a few things uh, for the community. Uh, and so um, I'm here today as part of the, uh, as, uh, of uh, the Amazon uh, PostgreSQL contributor team. Uh, you may see, have seen talks from some of my team work, co-workers like Bertrand, Druvo, uh, this morning about the logical uh, replication. So we are really part of the same team, and so it's thanks to them also that I'm able to be here. And um, so here's a bit about myself. Um, <coughs> about today's talk, um, the truth is that I've done this talk already once uh, to people internally and I was kind of, oh, you should perhaps do it at a conference, which is why I'm actually today. And talks like that tend to be uh, a lot political, saying like, if you do Postgres, you should do that or that. The thing is that this talk is not really about anything political, it's about the technical side of things. Uh, I could have named this talk my little PostgreSQL lit little dirty secrets, but that it does not sound good when it comes to the name of the talk. And it's a set of uh, things, uh, tricks, I've accumulated in all the years I've worked on Postgres, uh, how I actually do my stuff. Uh, people tell me, like, you, you do a lot of things. The thing is that if you want to be efficient, you need to design flows, uh, development flow process that makes it efficient for you uh, to do so. So um, what I have in this talk is something that perhaps you shouldn't do, but there may be one or two things you can is get some inspiration from and try to improve the way you do things. And this applies especially to PostgreSQL itself. So um, I have a few things on the agenda, uh, on the community, so that's perhaps a little bit uh, political, it's about the community uh, as a whole. And then I'm more dying, digging into uh, things like what I use as environments, uh, uh, and more things really internal to PostgreSQL. So if you are, uh, I'm just going to ask you a question. Who is here a contributor of Postgres or an extension maintainer or somebody who touches C code related to Postgres. I mentioned not only that for the backend, but also for the clients, like pgdump, tools, anything. Okay, so you have quite a bit of that. Um, my talk would be 
mainly for you, but I hope that you can find uh, pieces of advice that are useful when even it comes to being a developer as an open source project, because anything you do is public. Everybody can uh, see what actually you are doing. And this can bring some additional, I would say, pressure when you do things, because you, you, don't, you never want to do the bad thing, but you get more public exposure for anything you are actually doing. So uh, let's dive a bit into the talk. I have a few things about the community. Uh, PostgreSQL itself is about the mailing list. Anything we do in Postgres is email-based. It's old school these days now that we have interfaces like GitLab, GitHub, who are kind of the main, I would say, uh, popular solutions when it comes to open source development. But everything we do in Postgres is hosted by PostgreSQL.org. We do everything on the lists. Uh, something that's been mentioned quite a bit is that we have no bug tracker as well. So everything really happens on the PGSQL dash bugs. Uh, everything is really on the website itself. We have that centralized. Uh, when it comes to hacking code, the main uh, mailing lists are PGSQL uh, hackers, bugs, uh, dogs, when it comes to bug fixes, if you have a report, a feature, anything you would like to propose, basically for the core code, it comes down to those three lists. If you want to uh, register to those lists, you need a community account. Uh, there is something called the PG Lister that handles that, and that's really proper to PostgreSQL itself. Uh, so you have a set of public lists. There is also a set of uh, private lists. For example, you don't want to uh, have anything related to security uh, be available in the wild. So uh, you can make sure that if you report something that's worth a CV, that's somewhere else uh, hidden and uh, only a few set of people really into the PostgreSQL community have an access uh, to that. So I'm actually on the security uh, team as well. Um, so uh, if you send a patch to Postgres, uh, that's one thing also mentioned in the wiki. Uh, as a set of guidelines, I try to recommend people to use uh, commands like a git format patch, which is a huge advantage when you uh, introduce new files into the tree, because something like a simple uh, patch command is not able to track that correctly. If you have a git format patch, you can apply it back into the tree easily using a command like git am, even if it tends to be quite noisy and, flat and uh, fail easily compared to something like a single patch dash p uh, command. When it comes to me, uh, I've been handling uh, hundreds of patches, I don't know, perhaps thousands of patches among the years, and I'm okay with anything. I'm quite perhaps more open than some people, as long as I can apply it easily into the tree, or even in some cases, be able to read it and apply it uh, by myself, checking its logic, what happens. Uh, if you don't do things in ways that people don't really appreciate, they would tell you so. But uh, if you want to send a patch to Postgres, anything, uh, or just when you send a report, or uh, I don't know, some content that can be used to reproduce a given issue, you can look at the guidelines on the wiki uh, submitting a patch. Um, if you propose a new feature, one thing that I usually recommend is before diving into some getting something done that takes two, three weeks, a hell lot of time, you should try to discuss things on the community list if somebody has, is, in, is interested in a feature. There is also a to-do list on the wiki of Postgres. This is kind of uh, also something that's being discussed a lot in the, in the community, where the to-do list of Postgres is a list of the actual impossible tasks we have, and usually you should never actually take any of them. I wouldn't recommend that. The reason why they're on the to-do is that they are hard. If you are a newcomer into the community, even if you are a senior hacker, uh, I think you need a lot of courage to pick up those items. If you can bring uh, them into the end, actually, I find that absolutely amazing because these problems tend to be so hard that you, <laughs> I mean, it takes a lot of time, a lot of will uh, to get things uh, going through. But if you're interested in this list, you can always look at it. It's also on the, on the wiki. But just discuss things before getting anything done. 
uh, when it comes to the community process, we use uh, a concept called a commit fest for patches. So it's basically a patch tracker. We do not have a bug tracker. A commit fest also includes patches that can be used or categorized as uh, bug fixes as well. If you want to propose a patch into PostgreSQL, what you should actually do is first have a community account and then attach it uh, into uh, this commit fest uh, application. We have a status attached to the patch when it comes to uh, have a patch getting uh, other reviewed. And the end result is that the patch is either in review, gets committed, potentially rejected. You can also withdraw it if you want. Um, if you submit a patch to PostgreSQL, an implied rule is that if you author one patch, you should review one patch of rather equal difficulty. That's something impossible to measure, I'm going to be honest, but uh, you can get a sense or a feeling of what basically uh, uh, something of equal difficulty does. I would say that if you send one patch, you should even do more than one single review because people tend to send patches and not do any uh, reviews. So the review process also makes you familiar with the PostgreSQL uh, process and the flow of how things work. So I would even recommend people to do more reviews than patch authorship, such as you get even more attention to your own things and attract more people to say, oh, he's doing a lot of things, so perhaps I should help uh, the guy who does so many reviews and does patch authors. It doesn't work this way all the time. People work on patches depending on their time, but uh, we've been doing that for a few years and PostgreSQL, as this, com this conference shows, has a growing user base. So it seems kind of being a working model from what I know. Um, so uh, this includes bugs uh, and that's the URL of that. Uh, it's also on the wiki if you need some idea. When we develop PostgreSQL, we have what's called the development cycle uh, made of five commit fests, uh, July, September, November, uh, January and March. Uh, each uh, release of PostgreSQL gets a feature freeze in April after the last commit fest. And we fork the master branch uh, around the beta 2 release, which is just before the first commit fest of a new cycle. So uh, if you still have time uh, for the current development of PostgreSQL 17, you still have two weeks until the next commit fest of January if you want to propose something. The next, the last step for the next version of PostgreSQL that would be released in September, October 2024, based on the trends of the previous years means that you need to develop a patch by the end of February to get it into the, the uh, actual PostgreSQL uh, release. So uh, you need to think a little bit ahead of time if you want to submit anything. Um, and yes, we release uh, the major version in September, October. It's been the same way for the past five, six years, even more than that. And that seems to be a model that's been working quite well for us. So um, I'm going to dive a little bit more about the, uh, what I use. Uh, so here's a beginning about my actual dirty tricks, I would say. Um, first, I use what people I think call a set of dot files. Uh, my home repository is something that I embed directly, completely into a GitHub repository itself. All the scripts I have, all the things I use for Postgres are just a basic Git repo that I have in my home repository. I don't split things. I have something centralized. Yes. They are already on the website. Uh, so uh, do not take pictures of them. Just download them and just copy paste the URLs on the PDF. Um, yes, I did that few, I mean, it was a few days ago. Um, so uh, the thing is that when you work on Postgres, we have uh, support for so many types of environments. I do myself work on Postgres. I did a bit of FreeBSD, not much. Mac, Windows. If you need to test things, you need to be uh, quick in deploying a new environment, spin a new machine. I work on AWS where you can, you know, guys, uh, who actually uses AWS? I don't, I don't know, EC2, uh, anything, so uh, quite a bit. I want to spawn a new host. The thing is that each time I want to test Postgres, I want to test things in an efficient and consistent way. 
This stuff allows me to basically spawn an instance. I just log into the home repository. I do a git clone. A git, uh, you need to do a git init and git attach. But the thing is that if something takes me more than three commands, it's basically a failure, in my opinion. I try to be efficient, uh, to keep things very, very simple. And Git has helped me quite a lot on that. I know people have problems with Git. As a matter of fact, I don't. Perhaps you do, uh, in which case, perhaps something better is better for you, in which case you need to think through it. My point is that you should uh, design a process that's adapted for you, how you think, how you flow, your code, your process, everything. It happens that I've been doing that, and, I, and in order to be efficient, I've spent quite a lot of time designing that, thinking about it, how I want things to work for me. So uh, what I have is a uh, lot of uh, environment variables, uh, dot .files. Uh, the thing is that it also works with a kind of profiling. So I have, of course, public and private things. If I want to deploy quickly, I can basically use the default setup in the GitHub repo itself. Things like, uh, for example, I have private keys certificates are not never, of course, going to be there. Uh, but I use a second Git repository that I can plug into the first one. Uh, and I have hooks in the main one that allows me to plug in things like even uh, custom Git uh, configuration. Uh, I use Emacs. Uh, I don't use Vim, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm really an Emacs user. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can leave the, the room. I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> but the thing is that I've been using, like, it's a really a public hook system, which is something that also applies to Postgres if you use hooks inside the code itself. Um, one of the main scripts I've been using uh, is called basically PG compiled, because every, anything is Postgres begins by PG underscore, where you define a source folder, an installation folder. And the point is that if you act as a maintainer of PostgreSQL, we need uh, to maintain five years worth of PostgreSQL releases, meaning that even currently today, if I have to commit something to Postgres, I need to work across six branches itself. Uh, this doesn't count for external dependencies, which is something I have well, a few slides about, actually. So you need really a source path installation, and you want to have all the versions available at hand, especially if you do also uh, extension uh, development. If you have an extension that needs to work across, I don't know, five, six releases, even older than what PostgreSQL supports, you need to have things available at hand quickly because recompile it takes time. You want things, binaries at hand all the time. So I basically do that. Uh, and I have versions of PostgreSQL down to, I don't know, uh, 9.56, perhaps even in my tree or in my, not in this laptop, but I use also another host. Um, so here it is. When it comes to uh, Git, uh, I have a few aliases. Uh, you, if you are interested in them, you can test them, just copy, paste them into your Git uh, config file. I think it's in the ally, yes, I don't know. But if you're interested in that, you can also look into my Git repo and you would see what I use as Git uh, config. This has been working for me. Uh, perhaps it doesn't work for you, but I've been kind of uh, relying on that a lot. Uh, Git graph gives you a view on your terminal of the list of uh, commits you have across many, many branches. If you work on Postgres, we apply first a patch, for example, on the master branch and then work on each branches down. Uh, we need to make sure that the history is clean because other people rely on that. Uh, other people uh, want to make sure that we have a consistent set of rules when we do anything in Postgres. You need ways to check that. Uh, the way to check that is up to what you actually want to, you, to do. And I basically type key graph, I don't know, uh, five, six times, I don't know, even more than that every day because I want to check the consistency of the tree and that I'm doing nothing wrong. Uh, list files is another one I've been using. It basically lists me all the files I've touched in a single commit because we also do uh, need to do automated steps in PostgreSQL when you need to apply code indentation, for example. Uh, I need to improve that, but still that's one thing. I have other things like custom Git scripts that you can use. I have something called Git menage, which is a French term to say that just clean up the entire repository. 
and it doesn't clean uh, the actual Git repo that I use for my home directory because doing that would basically wipe out all the data I have uh, in my home directory, which is a very, very bad idea, of course. Uh, I think I did that once on VM and then implementing an actual secure safe uh, to not do that anymore. So it, it's not an alias, it's actually a script because that would be stupid. Uh, and of course, open files, PostgreSQL has a large uh, tree. Remembering all that is kind of complicated, so I remember a lot of the files, never their path, so I can open, find files if I need to. Uh, git prompt uh, that you can use and load at uh, login is also very, very useful. I mean, I love this stuff. You can know the state of your branch, everything uh, related to that. Other things include uh, core exclude files, like a set of uh, files you want to exclude, if I recall correctly, from the git repo that you want to ignore, like you have things like C tags, E tags that can be generated in the tree. You don't want that. I never wanted that. Uh, but you can set up that in your own environment, such as the same rules apply across all the tree. Uh, diff order file also is something that you do. You can order uh, the, uh, the how files are important for you when you see diffs. Uh, for example, I want documentation first, see files first. You can decide what kind of file applies first when you do a diff. Um, I think I learned the trick from the diff order file from Andres Front. So. I'm kind of just adapting. If you have tricks that you think may be useful, I mean, just feel free to uh, tell them to me because I'm a human, I don't know uh, everything. Basically, I know nothing. Uh, so I, I have also a concept that I've applied to myself is that any command I use should have a maximum of eight to 10 characters. I'm lazy, like lazy. If you want to be efficient, laziness is a key concept of a software developer, in my opinion. I want things, I don't want to think about typing things. I want things, I want results. I want things to be done. So when it comes to Postgres, I have four key concepts. If I'm working on the master branch, I want to be able to wipe out all the PostgreSQL instances I have installed. So I have uh, called it on this side, PG kill. Just why about everything? I don't want to think about that. I've been working, it's been crashing, it's been unstable. Sometimes I have deadlocks, they don't react even on sick terms. I okay, just, just forget about that and I need a breath and I, I just go working after shutting them down. Um, another thing I've been using is uh, being able to run the full set of uh, regression tests in Postgres with a simple PG check. Uh, my Git repo is in, the, is in this path called Home Postgres SRC, which is an environment variable just do a full set of regression tests uh, after a compilation. I have something that does compilation, then regression test run, such as I can basically type in five characters, a full set of checks, automated checks, that I apply after, doing a, uh, after applying a patch, depending on the set of uh, configure or Mason switches, of course. Uh, docs, doc patches, when you apply something to the PostgreSQL docs, HTML, uh, which is now an XML, based uh, set of docs is also something I've been using quite a lot. Uh, six characters, it's quick. Uh, you can check if an actual patch is valid before reviewing its contents. So you can easily check if it applies. This has saved me from a lot of stupid mistakes, like uh, before committing any patch, just make sure that even if you edit it, make sure that it still works because, well, you should not break uh, anything. Uh, I have alias aliases applied to each PostgreSQL version down to the versions to uh, support for uh, currently it's 12 to 16. So if I, for example, want to compile uh, PostgreSQL 12, I have something called PG12 all that does an automated testing of the PostgreSQL 12 tree. Uh, this does not include the automated checks. Uh, that's only automated, but there is of course a limit to that. You always need to check the state of a patch in the tree, uh, assumptions behind it. So it's not only what I do, but it's one of the validity steps I've tried to make as efficient as possible, such as I can keep focused on the state of a patch and how something should apply, check its surroundings or anything like that. So uh, regarding my test scripts, I have something called PG starts uh, that I can specify a dash S to spawn automatically a primary and a set of standbys because I've been doing a lot of work around streaming replication, not only logical, 
streaming physical across the years. This includes archiving. But I also use what I call a configuration profile, where I can append to PostgreSQL.conf a set of uh, custom configurations, for example, for performance, for more monitoring, for stuff like that. The main Git repo I have includes the basic set of things I've been using a lot, but I have also locally uh, custom things for uh, extension developments, as well as benchmarking, performance, and sometimes I just want PostgreSQL to run quickly without a minimum of logs or stuff like that. Um, PG upgrade is also something that I've been working quite a bit on. Uh, I have a script to do that. Uh, that basically spawns an instance, does some SQL loading on it, and you can run a, Postgres, a PG upgrade with a origin and target version automatically. Uh, we have much more features in the tree in a SR Sabine PG upgrade, uh, but I have a bit more about that later. So I'm basically kind of planning to drop that. So about the internals of Postgres, uh, I have a few things I wanted to mention. First, the C flags. If you look at the PostgreSQL tree, uh, we have a bunch of if def, a bunch of options, and we have also a lot of things that are not documented but implied that you should know. Uh, meaning that basically nobody knows about them except the committers and the more uh, hardcore hackers. Uh, so I wanted to mention these things. You can grab for them in the PostgreSQL uh, code tree if you're interested. But basically, if you send a patch, I would say that you should test any of them using these flags. So some of them are useful in some cases, some are not for others. But uh, when it comes to uh, testing a patch, the first one makes sure that you don't introduce regression tests with uh, names that we don't uh, actually want to have. For example, we, uh, since I think one, two years ago, if you create a role in a test script, it should be indexed by regress underscore. This enforces the rule check that we have in the build form. So if somebody commits a patch, that has uh, names that we don't want to have for basically any global objects. Uh, this generates a warning, and that would generate a script and automatically turn red some of the build farm members. So if you send a patch, just set it once, then forget about it. You can say the same thing about the write read past plant trees or copy uh, past plant trees that check the states of the nodes and make sure that uh, anything you do is uh, compliant in PostgreSQL, but this is kind of specific uh, linked to the uh, node infrastructure, with, but I mean like like uh, past nodes, prim nodes, and also I think it was uh, some of the planner nodes, but things uh, in this area. Uh, the fourth one also uh, applies to that, if I recall correctly, but basically I just set up that a few years ago and I just forget about them because I, I, I try to remember or to focus really on what matters. Uh, these are once the things I've been setting up uh, by default in any env environment I've been using. Um, so you have the GDB ones. If you want to do any kind of benchmarking, don't do that. Use something like O2. O3 generates warning in Postgres, if I recall correctly. Uh, but O2 is kind of the default in PostgreSQL. Yes, you do packaging, so you have comments about that, right? <laughs> Uh, which one? The last one. Does it have an effect on performance? Uh, the perf for perf profiles, no, I don't recall so because you can use it in the perf profiles and look at the. I've been using that for benchmarking and to do profiling using uh, Linux perf, but I'm not the best specialist on this one. Uh, Andres does a lot of that. I, I, I've been using it if I wanted to look at stacks uh, when I do benchmarking, but I been using that with O2 to get decent perf profiles and to find bottlenecks when it comes to specific uh, patches or when sometimes even I do micro benchmarking on given path. I've been using that quite a bit. You can see stacks and that, uh, but I don't recall it has an effect on performance even without it. Uh, somebody may correct me, I may be wrong, but no, I don't recall so. Um, but if you do in the packages, you may not actually need it or I mean, you don't add it in the packages, right? Uh, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, I mean, perhaps you've been adding them. It may be useful in some production. 
but uh, I don't think so. Uh, so um, for the C flags, I got a bit more of that. Uh, something called the Clover Cache Always is a very, very fun one. Uh, you should try to enable it once. <laughs> uh, what basically it means is that PostgreSQL uses in each backend what we call the relation cache or syscache. The rela I think, if I recall correctly, uh, this one, uh, actually it's relation cache first release, uh, this, makes, this stuff makes PostgreSQL really, really slower. <laughs> Because each time you allocate something in the cache and you free it, what this does is basically to trash uh, the cache entry and just freeing it. This is very useful in the cases where you want to check that your code is not using anything after freeing it. Such as if you release a syscache entry or anything, you can check after that. Uh, this is not efficient at all. This is going to make PostgreSQL uh, slower, but uh, we have some build farm members using that, and this is very, very useful for the cases of use after free. If you look in the, even in the Git history, if you grab for uh, use after free, stuff would be basically related to that. The thing is that if you try to enable it, and in the DB node, I think it takes even on a pretty good laptop these days, like 30 minutes, to just in DB. So uh, my trick on that is that you should never ever uh, run the full set of regression tests if you are tracking uh, use after free issue. Use binaries that do not use that. Any DB based on it, shut down the node, put it up back uh, with the flag and builds of that enabled, and then run individual test cases. Don't even think about doing stuff like uh, tap test using that. Just run individual uh, queries and just don't. Yes. <laughs> uh, it, it's for the use after free to make sure that you don't do any kind of incorrect manipulation of the real cache and syscache uh, in any kind of code. If I recall correctly. It's not performance. It's just for correctness of the code. <laughs> Uh, so we have, I think, still one build farm member that runs with a clubber cache always. I wanted to say thanks to the maintainer because I think it's a huge amount of CPU uh, getting used. Uh, even if you have a lot of the data into the OS cache, I mean, it's absolutely a disaster in terms of runtime and everything. Even for the build farm, I'm pretty sure it takes one, two days to run. Uh, don't even think about doing uh, anything related to the tap test or anything. It's not. I mean, that really will be crazy to do so. Uh, something I want to, to mention also is uh, for GCC, you have an M32 to emulate 32 bits builds. Uh, why it matters if you are tracking a bug uh, related to that. Um, I don't think many people use 32 bit environments these days, but emulating uh, that uh, has proved to be very, very useful for me. Especially, uh, I've been using Debian, you have uh, uh, libraries that are still 32 bits there. And so if you limit the option builds you use, that's very useful when it comes to debugging specific issues to that. Another one is uh, exec backend where you can emulate uh, Windows builds, but on Linux. Don't do that for any production builds. It's only for, dev uh, dev uh, for um, development, but you can emulate some of the Windows behaviors without having to use Windows. We need to support that because Windows has no idea how to do a proper fork of a process. We basically uh, spawn processes of PostgreSQL, like auto vacuum, work, auto vacuum, auto vacuum workers, launchers, uh, anything in Postgres using commands, and then these commands spawn completely different processes, not spawned from the Postmaster, but fetch a state, a state that's been uh, saved by the Postmaster, and then reattach to shared memory, which is really Windows-ish, but we, you can emulate that uh, on Windows. If you are debugging some issues related to your patches on Windows, you can use that actually in a much more efficient way than having to deploy a uh, Windows environment. So uh, since PostgreSQL 16, uh, not only do we support Configure, but also Mason and Ninja. Uh, and it's really, it's really nice. I'm really a huge fan of that. Uh, the thing is that as a maintainer of the projects, I cannot use only one of them, but I need to, to actually be able to work on both. So I've been learning how to do that. Um, one thing that I found kind of tricky with Mason is that it does an automated detection of the dependencies each time you try to use it. 
I think that's a trap, uh, to be honest. So I'm not sure if Andres is here, but it's not. Uh, but I, I, I tended to enforce a disable or enable switch, such as I get a predictable behavior of the dependencies I want uh, if I do that. Um, Configure and Meson have different uh, switches when it comes to the builds and the dependencies you expect. So uh, I have a common part between both, which is basically based on the C flags and LD flags if I want to link a build uh, to a given set of uh, dependencies. But the set of switches, I mean, they have to be completely separated. So I have two sections, even in my GitHub repo, where I have things completely separated and handled separately. Uh, there is a wiki page about that, so you can just have a look at it, and if you're interested in Meson, uh, it's actually a good start. The docs also in, of Postgres are quite good on that. Well, so when it comes to Windows, I don't think that many people do support on Windows, but it happens that I do because I maintain uh, that also partially. Uh, so if you use uh, Visual Studio or MinGW, uh, you can rely on the command prompt, like, I don't know, I think we support three, four ways to build Postgres on Windows, and Mason happens to be a new one. Uh, we still document the use of Active Perl. I recommend to not use it. That's something I'm planning to send a patch for, actually. Uh, but if it comes to the Perl binaries, you can use the MinGW uh, Perl commands, or uh, like a combination of chocolatey and strawberry Perl, which are much, much more straightforward. I've been doing some Windows stuff with Mason just to have a feeling of it. And that's been quite actually surprisingly uh, nice. Uh, it's much easier than the scripts that we have for Visual Studio. Uh, or even in GW. I mean, that's quite an improvement over the past things, and I've done quite a bit of Windows across the ages. Um, so you can also use PowerShell, uh, and I found that the Visual Studio compiler were a, a little bit faster than the other ones. Uh, so I have an overlap between Mason and Configure. C flags and LD flags are shared. The switches for the builds are completely separated for each one of them. And I'm going to say it again, but Mason Ninja is quite good in terms of reporting what actually we want to see in terms of build uh, regression tests. Uh, that's really, really nice. And I've been using Configure for like 15 years with a make. Uh, but that's quite a good uh, development uh, experience. We still need to support for Postgres uh, and Configure for many years to come, but having more options, uh, I think it's good uh, to attract new developers because, I mean, that's really nice to see things like that. Um, the build options are separated, so uh, with the configure you have the dash dash with, dash dash enabled. Mason uses a dash uh, D option equal enabled auto or disabled. So a word about OpenSSL. Uh, in Postgres, we need to support OpenSSL down to 0.9.8, which is a version that I assume nobody uses these days. Still, we need to support it. So uh, we currently need to support Postgres down to 12, uh, which means that we basically we have 0.9.8, and I don't know, now we are at 3.2, so it means 7, 8 versions. When you test a patch related to OpenSSL, you basically need to cross-check the version of Postgres with a given version of OpenSSL, meaning that you need to do basically 40 to 50 builds for one single patch. One patch. I, mean, I, I want to outline once again. One patch, even simple ones. We need to keep things stable. So, uh, yeah, you need C flags, LD flags, a path as well. Uh, be also careful if you do anything related to OpenSSL that Python or OpenLDAP may link to a different version of OpenSSL, meaning that you can basically corrupt stacks if you do an OpenLDAP or Python related, particularly PL Python. Uh, it's very easy to break, so just build without them if you use OpenSSL, because most likely you don't really care about uh, OpenLDAP if you do an OpenSSL specific patch or even Python as well. Uh, so about the regression tests of Postgres, uh, I would recommend these days to always test things with enable tab tests, and there is also a switch for Mason to make sure that uh, everything works uh, correctly across all the set of tests. Parallelize things. I mean, the code has been made stable, such as it can be made fast and really going very, very quickly. 
we have a PG test extra for what we call as insecure tests. Perhaps you may not want to enable them, but they need, they rely on extra assumptions that make them perhaps not something you should do, especially if you have a shared host or environment. Uh, there are other options like PG test, no clean, PG options, extra regression ops. Uh, that's also documented in PostgreSQL. You can pass custom options to much more fancy things depending on your setup. Uh, that's quite few things to be aware of. About install check, uh, any test you do need to be self-contained. If you run a set of regression tests like a make check in PostgreSQL, you should make sure that the tests are repeatable. So basically, if you create a global object like a role, I don't know, a database, a replication slot, uh, you need to drop it uh, at the end and just check, I don't know, uh, a make check twice in a row, such as you make sure that you don't leave anything behind. Uh, in Postgres, we also leave some objects around in the main regression test suite for PG upgrade because we want to test uh, upgrade scenarios across major versions, for example. So we do not clean everything, but we care a lot about global uh, things like roles or even slots uh, or even table spaces, databases, uh, for example, depending on what you want to do in your test. So be careful about that. Um, about PG upgrade, uh, it happens that we have improved in the last two years uh, the way you can do tests of PostgreSQL across different major versions. You, what you basically need is an old dump of some data uh, using a PG dump all of an old PostgreSQL version. You need an installation path and you can just run a make check to test if an upgrade to the version of the source tree you are working on is working correctly or not. That's cheap and you can actually uh, test things very, very, uh, in a very handy way when it comes to that. One thing is that we have code that's shared between the PostgreSQL builds farm and the code tree of PostgreSQL, such as because you need to manipulate the dumps from the old upgrades and to make sure that they actually work like a binary path of functions. We have tricks like that, but not only that, but the build farm and PostgreSQL itself share that. So if you have a patch that changes some rules related to objects, some objects that need to be dropped, for example, because we drop support for them, you can include everything in the same patch and not turn the build farm red uh, to make sure that the patch actually works, which is something we care a lot about. About the CI, uh, you can feel free to look at SRC tool CI README. Uh, you can do automated testing of PostgreSQL patches across five, six platforms and a patch. You can enable that on GitHub. I've been using and relying on that quite a bit uh, for sanity checks when it comes to patches. But basically, you can test uh, Windows uh, very, very efficiently, Mac OS, FreeBSD, Linux. Uh, just be aware that sometimes Cyrus requires you to do some, uh, may, may fail because you don't have the credits to do it. So do it but not too much. But I've been using that for uh, cross-checks of uh, patches, for example. Uh, code coverage, a uh, little bit about that. If you want to see how much of your code is covered by, by things, this is something people don't usually know. You can use a dedicated configure option or even do that in Mason to check how much of your code is covered. This can be plugged into the extensions as well. So you can run a make check and then do, uh, generate a nice HTML coverage report to see how much of your code is getting covered. I know people tend to have some uh, requirements regarding, for example, my extension needs to have 70, 80% of coverage. Uh, this can come very, very handy if you have requirements depending on your company or what you actually want to achieve. Um, so about pinging a committer, um, I don't think I have much time left, so I'm going to be quick on that. It's not the most relevant part of the talk anyway. So um, what it actually means to be a committer of PostgreSQL. So it means that, uh, so I've been a committer of Postgres since 2018, so it's been five years now. Uh, I have a commit track record of, I think, 1,000, yeah, it's written 400, but maybe a bit more than that now. Uh, and of course, it's an ongoing series because it happens that I've been doing bug fixes uh, mostly on a daily basis for the past five years. Uh, I even did one yesterday. I may, my may, name may be on the top of the tree even today, except it's somebody did something in the last 24 hours. Um, so the thing is that you have a kind of social contract with the community. Anything you do is something that you are responsible for. I'm in AWS for the past uh, year or so, and anything I've committed is something that uh, I need to be to take care of, even if 
I did that at a previous company or anything like that. So um, errors are okay. Uh, you will do them anyway, like any project. Just be responsive and responsible for anything you do. If you are an author or reviewer and somebody committed your code, feel free to help them as well. I think it's very important to get feedback on what you do. You may be wrong. The committer may be wrong, miss something. It's important to help each other in that. Um, that's something, so I'm running out of time, but I'm using a Git work tree. I think it's really nice when you work across many uh, branches and stuff. More efficient if you want to keep uh, builds around or uh, references of the tree if you need to look at some files. Um, being a committer means that you should never break the build farm. Uh, we have tools uh, to do indentation of the C code per code. If you send a patch, a committer is responsible for doing that. If you do it when you send a patch, it's nicer because it means less work for the committer who will take care of your patch. Uh, some things you should not do is uh, catalog version bumps, wild format bumps, and uh, control file bumps, which basically happen once every five years for the control file. Um, Authors should never do that. Committers are responsible for that because it means that your patch would basically get uh, more conflicts uh, each time somebody else updates those seals because they are shared across the whole system. Uh, applying a patch means that we apply the patch on master and usually it's a cherry pick process where you just go down all the way down to each version and you need to do things ind independently for each uh, branch. Um, so, yeah, that's external libraries. If you have something that depends on a library, my point here is that you should also check that your patches actually work if you do not build with those libraries. For example, if you have an OpenSSL thing, just make sure that what you do also works if you do not enable OpenSSL. Uh, I saw many things breaking across the ages uh, when it comes to that. Uh, and in the more stable branches you support, the more uh, scenarios you need to think about. Uh, OpenSSL is the most painful one I've been dealing with for the past five years, so I've been dropping versions uh, as much as I can. Uh, head supports still uh, OpenSSL down to 1.0.2. Um, yeah, I've been running a little bit, some extra time, but that's everything I have. So if you have any questions, I think we don't have much time for questions. Maybe one or two questions. But you can also catch me after if you want. Everybody's tired. If you don't have any questions, it's fine. It's been three days of conference, so thank you so much. Um. I, I saw, I just looked at your code. Thank you very much for this. And thank you for putting slides first. I mean, it's very useful. I, I actually started using stuff. And uh, uh, I see that you use one set of C flags for all builds, like your scripts, PG, all, and everything when you compile, you build with the same C flags, uh, like everything. But do you have a way to manage like multiple builds with different C flags? So you have like 12 with this, uh, 12 with this, 12 with this, and 12 without yeah. open SSL. Uh, like, so you have like, like 16, 20 builds in parallel? Yes, so uh, when it comes to that, actually, I just tend to update manually those styles. But uh, something that I've also been using is what I call the concept of uh, profiles in my Git repository. Because I can, I have also, uh, if you look at the Git repo, I have something called Spatch. That allows me to basically switch uh, the hooks and the private repositories I have. So I've been also doing that a bit to switch things in more in a much quicker way. But it means that I'm maintaining the dot files in more places. So I have basically a command that I call just patch because I could not come up with a better name. Uh, it's patch conf and you specify a name and you just switch automatically all the files that I use for the extra rules uh, as well. So my OpenSSL stuff is not on the public repo, I think it's in the private one, but I've been kind of relying on that as well to do OpenSSL 1.0.2 in one simple command. The thing is that I need to reload the session. So I need to open a new terminal each time I update that, but that's Okay, I mean, it's just, I use a tiling manager, like i3, so it's just one command from the keyboard, so it's very quick. Um, yeah, but I, I have that uh, at command level as well. Just, I don't publish them because I want the public thing to be minimalistic, and if people are interested, I mean, yeah, sure, feel free to, but I don't think the goal is to have thousands of people using it. Just find some inspiration and just pick up the pieces you th think are good for you. 
Yeah, so you mentioned that you're uh, building a Postgres with various versions of the library to test uh, the library uh, to test the correctness of Postgres. But does that also mean that, for instance, if you're committing to a patch to the B3 code, uh, that you would do the same for all the libraries as well? Or is it that you only do that when you're touching actually the areas of... No, I'm just yeah. doing that and, and when I touch the actual areas because it doesn't make sense to uh, touch. Uh, for example, if I'm going to patch something related to recovery, I'm not going to touch OpenSSL. Uh, but I have the default set of settings, so... But no, it, it doesn't matter. If it's really something specific to OpenLDIP, Kerberos, anything like that, I just manipulate those versions. Uh, I've been dealing with uh, dependencies with uh, LibXML, OpenSSL, uh, mainly... There may be some other things. But yeah, uh, OpenSSL has been kind of the main thing, uh, the main bottleneck uh, when it comes to that. Okay, thank you very much. Yep.